wait, are we on mute again? No, we're on mute. Oh. We're on mute. There, I'm just trying to wait. Broad, broadcasting from Vorhi. Yes, that's <laughs> my brother. Now I muted everybody because I think we're all here and we're going to get cracking. Um, so what, um, if you look at the bottom of the participants window, you should see a button that says raise hand. Um, and I think just because of the number of people, it would help me if you could uh, use that if you want to share something because I can't see everybody on gallery view at one time. So if you raise your actual hand, I might miss you. Uh, but if you use the raise hand button, I'll be able to see you. So um, what I'd like to start with is um, before we get into the comparison and contrast, um, if people could share some of your impressions of the tone and major theme of either Hannah's prayer or Yona's prayer. Uh, Jeff, go for it. Hi, so we, um, our little group kind of concluded and agreed that Hannah's prayer, a couple things. One starts out in the first person and then goes to more broad concepts, but overall is the form of prayer that's praise without really much of an ask, because she already got what she wanted. She got a son. Whereas Jonah's prayer is almost universally in the first person, and while there are elements of praise, there's also an ask from God in it. So we kind of viewed it as maybe a compare and contrast of different forms of prayer could be to feel on how we might you know, view prayer. Great. Awesome. Thank you. So, so there's, there's, um, the, there are types of prayers and there's a prayer that is a request prayer and there's a prayer that is a gratitude prayer. And so one way of looking at these is to say, well, Khan is offering a gratitude prayer. And this is, uh, in fact, actually the second time that Hannah prays. Because uh, the first time that she prays, she wants a child. And the second time that she prays is this occasion of her giving gratitude for the three-year-old child that she has raised thus far, who's now going to live with uh, Ailey, the, the high priest, and to serve in the Mishkan. Uh, whereas Jonah is seeking something that he doesn't have yet. Uh, Jenny, you can go next. Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I think we hit the, you got to unmute again. Okay. No? Yes. Again. Okay. Um, that there is, to me, there's a lot of praise in Hannah's prayer, but I don't see much personal thank you for what God gave her. I mean, she, she definitely, it, it, there, there's, there's a lot of positive description of God, but she's, I, I, I assume that at some point she said, thank you. But I don't see that here. Uh, the, the confusing thing about Jonah is that he's thanking God before uh, the, uh, the whale spits him out. I mean, whoever wrote this down got it a little backwards. Well, see, I thought that at first too. I'm, I'm going to come back to Hannah in a second, but I thought at first also that right there, there's something backward about um, Yona, except that the author frames this by saying that Yona prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Right. So, so the 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 potential literary reading of oh, it's a retrospective prayer or something like that, or it's a flashback is undermined by the actual framing of the narrative hmm. right which says to us he prayed from the belly of the fish and he said so so it's it's a tricky thing of kind of what's going on here particularly Ginny, i think you were pointing to um to verse 10 but i need a call to die i with loud thanksgiving will sacrifice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah also verse 7 you brought my life up from the pit. But 
nobody's brought his life up from anything at that point. It's not till verse 11. Mm. Okay, good. So there's this real question of like, how do we understand Yonah saying, Vital nishachar chayai, that you brought my life out of the pit while he's in the belly of the fish? Um, we're gonna I'm, we're gonna sit with that question. We're gonna let that question be kind of floating for a little bit, um, and we'll come back to it a little bit later. Uh, Sheila and Dan. Uh, yes. Well, our group um, really felt the the gratitude in uh, Yona's prayer more and and praise um, in Hannah's prayer. Um, that it, it was more about you know God's power. Um, and on a larger scale, and Yona's prayer was more um, more personal, really reflecting that despair that he was going through. And there is, I, you know, I see gratitude there in what we just said about you. You brought my you brought my life up from the pit when my life was ebbing away. You answered my, you, you know, you heard my voice. You answered me. There's there's this. Uh, we're right in the middle of of his experience of, of faith emerging, of, of um, feeling that he's not alone in the pit and trusting that God is going to deliver him. Uh, and it's, it's, very, it's very powerful, very moving in this kind of quiet, quieter way. Okay, good. And this was something that I had heard a number of groups bringing up that um, Hannah's prayer is somewhat retrospective in the sense that um, the deliverance that she sought, she has received. Where Yonah's prayer is in the moment or it's prospective, he's in the middle of the trouble that he is trying to be rescued from. Right. And so their their location on their own life arc is different in each case. Gary? The other thing that our group talked about is that, you know, for a a religion that, that does not usually speak about afterlife or or perceptions of of uh, purgatory or hell of any nature, both of these prayers mention Sheol and a place of the gathering of the dead. And where in Hannah, she says that God can cast someone down in Sheol, where Jonah thinks he's in the belly of the beast and he is in Sheol. And we just thought, you know, interestingly that in the commentary, you know, that according to the commentary that in biblical Israel, this was common thought about Sheol. And we were also discussing how we sort of moved away from that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the you know, the, it's interesting because the Bible's conception of the afterlife is sort of two part. Um, people who have difficult lives, and not necessarily people who have done wrong, um, but people who do difficult, people who have had difficult lives, go down to Sheol, um, which is what you don't want. What you want to happen is to lie with your ancestors. That's the good way to go. Um, and, uh, but we know that this isn't like a, a sin and punishment kind of a thing necessarily because um, Yaakov famously says that um, after he thinks that Yosef is dead, that, you know, there's nothing left for him but for his head to go down to Sheol, right? So it's, um, so it seems to be attached to people who have had a lot of service in life rather than necessarily being about sin and punishment as, as a kind of Christian conception of hell would have it. Um, but basically like what you want when you die is to go and lie with your ancestors or sleep with your ancestors. And what you don't want is to go down to Sheol. Um, and we know very little about Sheol other than that it is in a downward direction. Um, um, but those, but they are actually, you know, when you start to read Tanakh, um, particularly the poetic sections of Tanakh. Um, so here in the Tehillim and the Psalms, it comes up a lot, um, is where you start to see these references to uh, Sheol. Um, and it's, it's less familiar in our parlance, um, I think in part because the Talmudic concept of Gehenna um, displaced it. 
Um, and there you do have a much more um, reward and punishment kind of a frame around the afterlife than you do, um, you know, the, the Bible definitely has a good afterlife and a bad afterlife, but it's, it's not so morally defined as we get in later thought. Rabbi Sue? Oh, I was also thinking about the contrast between the Torah and the Tanakh, that here um, Hannah is expressing the, um, at first the longing and then the appreciation for her own fertility in a way that we don't see very much with the matriarchs. And in some ways, you know, here the Ketuvim give us an opportunity to have an expansion of both the longing and the desire and the frustration and then the appreciation and the celebration. Um, and we were really struck by how uh, not necessarily impersonal, but how expansive Hannah's prayer is, that she is so much aware of a larger canvas, that it's not only her particular experience, that's the viewpoint that she uses, but she's thankful to God's largesse. And, and in it also is the sense that the wicked are punished and that the lowly are lifted up. Um, I also was struck reading Yona's words, which of course we've read many times, but to the same kind of kind of potential parallel um, of Joseph's silence when he is thrown into the pit, and the fact that you bring up his story um, and his father's grief, but the midrash, of course, fills out Joseph's story for us, um, and even has him visiting the pit on his way back from Egypt and his brother's fear. It's a whole very rich story that I happened to read this week with another teacher. But here is calling out from the pit and praying, in Jonah's case, not the pit, but the pit of the belly. And I just love thinking about the juxtaposition of the physical pit into which Yosef is thrust um, by his brothers and the fact that he indeed is um, delivered from it and we really don't hear much, like almost nothing from him about that experience. And yet here we have Jonah's words. So thank you for giving us this opportunity. Oh, thank you. And that's something, you know, I hadn't seen that before, but I think you're right that the, by giving us these prayers, the, the Tanakh is giving us a window into um, Hannah's and Yonah's inner life, their thoughts and feelings that we often don't get um, in the Torah characters. Um, and that the Midrash then spends a lot of time filling in um, the, the, the inner process of these characters. Um, but here, you know, it's not like you would get in a kind of contemporary novel where it would say, you know, and then Yona felt, like we don't get that, but, the, but we can read the prayer and extrapolate what were his thoughts and his feelings and his inner reaction and the same for Hannah that we can extrapolate her experience a, a much a much more multi-dimensional experience we can infer from the prayer than we would have gotten without uh Dan Sheila um this is Dan um what do we do <clears throat> what do we do with the context of the of uh the Jonah story. I mean, at this point, you have to, one I think has to remember, he was told to go and deliver a message, a negative message to Nineveh. And he said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go on a ship. And then the, the sailors decided to throw him off, but he was, he was intent on disobeying the order that he was given. So when he is in the belly of the whale, he's still in a situation of trying to run away from God and disobeying God. How, do, how does that all that fit in with his praise of God here? I mean, is he just saying, 
sort of covering up the fact that he was intent on disobeying God or has he changed his mind or what? Well, so I think, I, so I, I, I'm going to say, actually, I'm going to circle back. I think the answer to that question lies in Hannah's prayer also, um, which was um, right, some of the groups brought up this question of like, she never actually says like, hey, thank you. I wanted this kid and I got the kid and now I have the kid. Thank you. Right, that, um, that there's not that like direct expression of gratitude. And um, my reason for wanting to bring all of this is because, um, you know, these are the first and last hafta wrote on days where we have the longest services and more services than we have on any other day. Um, and I would take even like, I almost take these hafta wrote as a hint that Already in the time of our sages, people thought that shul was too long on these days. That there was like too much, <laughs> too much to say, too much to sing. Um, and, and I think that what Chazal are offering us in choosing these haftarot are um, opportunities for, for us to frame how we're going to approach prayer and to see these models of, of prayer. Um, and Suzanne was mentioning in one of the breakout groups that Hannah is actually the role model of prayer, um, right? If you look at uh, the Gemara for all of the description of how we daven, um, the way that we daven, they learn it all out from Hana, but they learn it all out from Hana's prayer in the first chapter where we don't know what she said but we get a description of the posture and attitude and style of her prayer. She spoke in a low voice. She was hunched over. She was submissive, right? I mean, you know, so, so they, they read out our posture, our actual posture for the Amida is based on Hannah's actual physical posture as described in chapter one. They don't work with chapter two as much. Um, and so, you know, thinking about this question of like, where's the verse in here where she says, by the way, God, I prayed to you for a son and then I got a son, so thanks for that. I think about, you know, there are things There are things that are too difficult for us to talk about directly. Right? So she never says, oh, you know, I was, I was suffering, I was having a hard time, and then I, um, I was answered, I was delivered. Um, but I think this middle section, verses four through seven, where it's so much about reversal of fortune, Right, the, the bows of the mighty are broken and the faltering are girded with strength. The ones who used to be full have to go buy bread and the ones who used to be starving are not hungry anymore. Uh, the barren woman bears seven while the mother of many is forlorn. She has to be talking about herself. You know, it's, it's almost as if like she, she still three years later um, can't bear to actually talk directly about what she went through. And so she approaches it in this, in this oblique kind of way in which she talks of, of, in these abstract images of reversal of fortune, but she's really talking about the reversal of her own fortunes. Um, and this is the first thing that I think, you know, the, the rabbis are, are offering us in this Haftarah is to understand that sometimes, sometimes we have to pray indirectly. Right? Like sometimes it's just too much to say the actual things that are on our heart. And we need a way to express them um, or, or perhaps to say that it's okay if we need to express them in more abstract ways, right? Maybe it's okay for me to say the words that are in the machzer 
And to know in my heart that really I'm talking about this actual situation that I'm living through in my life, but I actually can't bring myself to talk about it, even to talk about it between myself and God because it's so painful. Um, and so I'm gonna use the words of the Moxer that are these general, collective, universal words, but I'm gonna know that I'm really talking about myself. Uh, David? Yeah, I, I said in, in our group, I, I distinguish between these two prayers because I, in looking at Hana, I see it more as a reaffirmation of what she believed in before, because she, she, um, she says, if the, the, the earlier prayer she makes before she has a son is, if you'll give me a son, I will dedicate that child to you. But she's already sort of, um, she she's already has the commitment to God at that point, whereas uh, Yona didn't have it. He, he ran. And um, what's interesting is he's, he's decided to change his view even before he's going to get spit out of the whale. I said in our group, what would have happened if the whale hadn't spit him out? Um, and, you know, there, there's sort of different, I see a different context here. Somebody who comes from like denial and is accepting and someone who has always been accepting, but feels that she's, she may have been let down. And so she's reaff she's able to reaffirm in such strong words and it's more general because it's not just about her, her, her commitment and how she sees uh, Adonai. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to take up that question that you asked about Yona, but I'm going to, I'm going to raise you one and say, what would have happened if the fish hadn't swallowed him? Because if we come back to this line um, that you raised the question about earlier, Vital Mishachat Chayai, that um, God brought my, you brought my life up from the pit. Um, he thought he was going to drown. And he may well have wanted to drown in that moment, right? He, he might have in that moment said, like, I would rather drown than go to Nineveh. And then he gets a second chance, right? And, and I think that that's part of why it's so important that it says earlier, um, that Yona prayed to Adonai his God from the belly, uh, from the, the guts of the fish, um, lest we do the nice literary thing of saying, oh, it's a flashback. Right, the, the, the author denies us the ability of flashback uh, so that Vital Mishachat uh, Chayai, you lifted my life out of the pit, has to refer to what's already happened or happening and not what's about to happen uh, because of the framing. And so it's, you know, when you were talking about denial, um, you know, we're like almost like imagine Jonah in recovery. Like he, he was in denial of the problems he was making for himself, in denial of the mess he was making of his life. Um, and then he, he hits the bottom and he gets a second chance. But he's willing to make the commitment before he knows he's gonna have that chance. Right? Well, but, that's, I mean, but that's again why I come back to the question of not what if the fish hadn't spat him out, but what if the fish hadn't swallowed him in the first place? I right. think he's already feeling like it was over for me. And now in the fish is my second chance and I'll take what comes. You know, right. I'm, I'm whether, whether, and, whether I get spit out or not, I'm making a commitment. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to make a commitment and I'm going to, and I'm going to, I'm going to choose a different path. And that's, and, and in verse nine, where he says, those who cling to empty folly forsake their own welfare, um, don't be fooled by the next line being, but I. He's talking about himself in verse nine. But that's his turning point, where he says, I was the fool, right? or he can't bring himself to say, this is again, right? Where he says, I'm gonna say in third person what I can't quite bring myself to say about myself. I was the fool who forsook my own welfare and now I'm not going to anymore. Um, Terry? 
Uh, you're muted still. All right, here we go. Uh, my comments were going back to the Hannah prayer, where I think uh, in the first verse, she is giving personal thanks for what has happened to her. And Hannah prayed, my heart exalts in Adonai. Why does it exalt in Adonai? Because her prayers were answered. I have triumphed through Adonai. God has answered my prayers and I have triumphed. I've given birth to a son and we'll forget to gloat over the enemies. And then I rejoice in your deliverance. I think that those three lines are really showing her personal thankfulness for God answering her prayers. Okay, great. So there, so so we can read expressions of gratitude in here. Yeah, yeah. Jenny, um, I was just thinking, uh, so that for Yana, basically, it looks reversed. That is it. But what allows? the fish to spit him out is that he has already made the change. He's already decided not to despair. And we know that he has changed his attitude because right below it, when God speaks to him a second time, it says here, Jonah went at once to Nineveh. So he had already made the change in himself and was no longer in despair. And then the fish spit him out. Oh, and that's a, that's a beautiful insight for this time that it can take time and sometimes years worth of time to really work through changes in our lives. But the, the will to change comes in a moment, right? And, and the, you know, a, a, a number of you have heard me say this before, right? I mean, this, the, the things that are easiest to talk about are hardest to do. Um, but sometimes these life changes that will take years to realize are nevertheless rooted in a momentary shift in perspective or a momentary shift in commitment, right? And so Yonah still has to go through with this whole business of going to Nineveh and proclaiming his prophecy. And then there's chapter four, which is a subject for a different year. Um, but the but but there is he he is reborn literally, right? He comes out of this fish um, based on a moment of awakening. Ira? Yeah, um, you, you just took some of the words out of my mouth, because uh, I had made a reference to the fact of it's a comparison of birthing and a re in, in Hannah's point, point of view, and uh, a rebirthing for, for Yona. But in Hannah's case, it's, it's this conditional gratitude. If you give me the son that I will give him to you, it's not like she's changed. She, you know, she became a mother. Yes, she weaned him, and that now she delivers him three years later. But has how has she changed her life? The question is, did she have? In, in, when you go through the whole litany of the things that she was listed in her prayer, is it somewhat of a, a post-traumatic stress, you know, disorder that she hasn't resolved even the even after the fact of giving birth? Whereas Yona is giving his thanks to God for rescuing him from the water, the fishes that meet him to save him from certain death. And he's, he's now, he's in the moment, he's promising that he will do this and he will make the sacrifices and so forth. And then what happens? God commands the fish to spew Yona out. Okay, that's great. And, I, and this is, um, I think this is, this is again, right? This is an important thing for us to be aware of as we're approaching these days of extended prayer. Um, sometimes there are changes in our lives that heal the pain of the past. And sometimes there are changes in our lives that are real and the pain lingers and persists. Um, and, and there are, I'm inclined to say that like, 
we are going to pray sometimes as Yona and we are going to pray sometimes as Hana. There are going to be times where our prayer is going to mark a, a wiping clean of the past the way that it does for Yona. And there are times where our prayers are going to filter through the lingering pain of what we've experienced, like it does for Hana. Rabbi Sue? I think you have to. Well, unmute. you yeah. gave us a lovely nefemta. Um and I I was just going to underscore the fact that there is chapter four. You know, here Yona can't keep it. He can't hold on hmm. to his clarity and says, "If you get rid of this plant, I'm going to die." You know, and then there's this very interesting ending when we read it together as a community and um, where what's happened. I mean, what, what goes with Yona's behavior is so much our own. I'll speak for myself. I had this very clear idea and I dedicated myself to it. But then when the going got rough, I was like, I can't stand it. Don't, you know, without this plant, I'd rather die. Um, and I also just wanted to mention that Hannah's prayer is preceded by a very heartfelt um, and open-hearted, very personal prayer. That before she goes into this more formal prayer, it's almost as if um, addressing God, and you pointed out that we have several voices of Hannah. But here, you know, she says to um, when she's bringing him to Shiloh, she says, um, as I live, my God, I am the woman who stood here. This is the boy I prayed for. Adonai gave me what I asked. And now I'm giving my child to Adonai. So we don't really know, you know was her initial commitment of the, of the baby that didn't exist to God out of desperation, I'll do anything, God. I'll even give him to you. I will dedicate my child to you. And now at the moment where she actually has to do it, it's very hard. It's very hard. We, you know, we've all done it in a different kind of way. But even sending a child off to school and at different times in a child's life, am I ready to let this child go to daycare, to kindergarten, to middle school, to high school, to college? And the answer for all of us is yes, we're, we find a way to be ready, but it doesn't mean that it's easy to let our child go off into the world. So, you know, kind of all the more so alchat kama v'chama for Hana with a little three-year-old. Yeah, and there's two, you know, so there's two things I wanna, I wanna highlight in what you said. Um, one is, this reality that even happy endings can have sadness and pain in them, right? That like, you know, she got what she wanted and she's giving him up. And, and you know, and again, right, there's so many midrashim about, you know, that she would, she would come and she would cook for him and she would do his laundry and, right? and she kept mothering him all those years that he was living in the, in the, the Mishkan. Um, that she she still got to have that relationship with him, um, and that's midrash. And there's a there's a bittersweet quality to this prayer. On the one hand, it's affirmed her belief that God is a champion of the downtrodden. Um, on the other hand, she's relinquishing. Um, and the other thing I wanted to, I, that just that you said that really took me was the compassion that you have for Yona, who changes and doesn't, um, just like we keep changing and not. Um, and 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 I think what what I'll say for me anyway for this year is that um, I feel I feel very un-American saying this, but I think that chapter four doesn't make chapter two a lie. It was the fact that Jonah ends up uh, just as kind of petty and bitter at the end as he was at the beginning doesn't mean that this isn't true in chapter two, where he has this awakening and this change of heart. 
Um, and, and I say that so that we can have that compassion for ourselves when we make a change and then we turn out maybe not, or, or we did and we didn't, right? You know, it, you know we, we, we change and we don't quite change. Um, and, I, and I'm so grateful for your, for your uh, Rahmanas, for your compassion in, in identifying that in him and in us. Harris? Yeah, we, um, we spoke a little about this in our group and, um, and at the time I didn't necessarily see a whole lot of depth to it, but the more I think about it in this conversation, um, maybe it's because my brain works in Pashut. It's, you know, I have a simple brain, right? Um, that, uh, that probably no one on this call will argue with. So, um, I, I couldn't help focus, and I had never really seen it before, I guess, in all the years that we read this uh, in, in um, Hannah's prayer. But at the end, she refers to the fact that there's going to be a king selected. And, um, you know, and, um, and the power of that king is going to come from Hashem. And... Um, and, I, and I've been thinking about this ever since we discussed it just briefly in our group. And I said, you know, first of all, there's a whole theme of Om Rosh Hashanah, of Machiyot, right, kingship. And then secondly, maybe a simpler way to read this is to look at it and say, this entire prayer is reflective of the historical context of what's going on with B'nai Yisrael at that point, um, the yearning for a king, and this whole prayer could very well be construed as Hannah saying, you guys want a king, just remember where all of the power of that king and all the greatness, you know, you want to talk about a king, let's talk about the true king and all the attributes of that. And... Um, you know, in that way, of course, it's totally, you know, devoid of most of the things that everybody's added uh, so far in terms of depth and had his prayer and all that. And it, it's really Pashut and it talks about the historical context. It, it's a way that I read it, but maybe nobody else reads it that way. Well, but I, you know, I, I want to, I want to remind us that in this kind of a, an exercise where we're looking at Tanakh, um, that simple reading is often a very important reading, right? I mean, I was, um, I've got my, I've got my sheets here. Um, I was very, you know, I, I did it this way, putting each chapter just on a page and working with the highlighters, because um, I wanted to be scrupulous about not looking at commentaries in Midrashim. Um, you know, and, and I just know myself, like if it's on the page, even what's in the margins of the Leif Shalem Machzer, like I'm going to look over there. I'm going to, you know, want to see. Um, and so I think, I, you know, I want to say for everyone, when we do this kind of an exercise, it's so important to encounter the text as it is. Um, and I think Harris, it's not accidental that she, that she ends where she ends. Um, because the immediate next thing that's going to happen in the story is the decline of the political power of the high priest and the emergence of Shmuel first as a political leader and then um, eventually Shaul and David. Um, time is interesting in these, in these prayers. Um, and this is something else that I think is... Um, is like important for us to think about in terms of our own tefillot as we're going into Yom Kippur. Um, Yonah is a kind of, Yonah offers a kind of prayer that is very firmly rooted in the present, right? I mean, you know, he is, he is describing his own predicament in real time. Um, Hannah's prayer is both past and future, um, and, and I do think in the middle of it, in verses four through seven, she's talking about her present experience, but extremely obliquely, you know, really not very, um, not very head on. Um, and it's something just for us to think about, like, where are we at? What kinds of prayers are we going into Yom Kippur to offer? Are, are we 
rooted in the moment that we're in right now? Are we reflecting on the past? Are we yearning for the future? Um, and I'll say, you know, kind of contrary to general mindfulness thinking, um, I don't think there's a premium to be placed on being in the present versus being in the past or the future on these days. Um, I, I think there are really good reasons why our prayers might dwell on the past or, or seek the future um, versus the present. Um, I think, right, you know, it's a problem if we're going to the past or the future as a way of avoiding the present. Um, but there are ways in which the in which the past may be more present for us or more available to us right now, uh, or or in which the future may be weighing on us in ways that the present doesn't. Um, and I think the Chana's prayer validates that and says, you know, prayer prayer can range over the span of time. Um, and we should be praying from the, the time orientation that we need. Um, another thing that I noticed that really didn't come up um, in this has to do with direction and location in these prayers. Um, um, if you look, I, you know, again, I went through with a highlighter. Um, Chana has a lot of of ascending words. Um, so Rama is is like a, a high place or going up to a high place. Kavoha, Gavoha, uh, lofty. Um, Morid Sheol, Viyaal, God casts down into Sheol and raises up. Mashpil, God uh, casts down, makes people lowly, af meromain, and lifts them back up. Mekim, Meafardal, uh, he raises the poor from the dust. Meshpot Yarim Evyon lifts up the needy from the dung hell. The, over and over again, the direction of the verbs for Chana, yes, as Rabbi Sue just did, if you didn't see that, right? The Chana's direction is up. Um, Yonah's prayer is much more horizontal than vertical. I'll get to that in a second, what I mean by that. But when he does have vertical movement, um, Tashlicheni Mitsula, you cast me into the depths. Um, to home, Yisovaveni, the abyss surrounds me. Uh, yarad, lekitzve uh, harim yaradti, I descended to the base of the mountain. Um, but when I say that Yonah is more horizontal, um, we have this one line in Hannah's prayer, rachav pi al oivai, uh, where it says, I gloat over my enemies. Literally, my mouth became wide. Um, where Yonah says, Karati mitzara, I called from a narrow place, mi beten sheol, from the belly of sheol, belevav yamim, in the heart of the sea, uh, suf chavush laroshi, weeds wrapped around my head, twined around my head. Um, so, so Yonah's prayer, when I say it's horizontal, he's, he's in a compressed tight space this way, and Chana is reaching up this way. Um, but again, something for us to think about, um, you know, and I offer this really kind of for today and tomorrow more than for Yom Kippur itself, um, to think about like, well, what are, what's the direction that we want to use? The, way the verbs that we use um, have an impact in how we pray and how we express that prayer. Um, you know, and even the way we think of it, people say like, I'm feeling down today. It's like, okay, well, so then what does that look like in prayer, right? There are down words that we can use to express downness, or I'm feeling expansive. There are wide words that we can use to, um, not just to describe what we're feeling, but to invoke for ourselves in our prayer what we're feeling. Um, likewise, the imagery that they use um, Chana, who is at the Mishkan, uses multiple images of palaces. Jonah, who is in the belly of a fish under the ocean, uses metaphors of drowning and, and submersion. Um, and, and I bring this up because our prayers are very temple-focused in their imagery. 
and they were written to be recited in the synagogue, and we call our synagogue temple Beth Zion, Beth Israel, and we have a majestic room with grand regal architecture that the vast majority of us are not going to be in for Yom Kippur. Um, so so I, I bring that up to say there's an opportunity between now and actually the start of Yom Kippur to think about, well, what are the words that will resonate with the space that I'm actually going to be davening in? Um, you know, whether that's a, a living room covered with bookshelves or it's a dining room with a lovely table or it's the porch of a house on the shore, right? You know, what what's going to evoke truth in my prayer that's true about the space that I'm praying in? Uh, if I'm not going to be in the sanctuary, that's the space that these things were written to evoke. Um, so I, I, I want to encourage us to actually like kind of take this time to really prepare specifically for how we're going to pray. Because right? I, I think that most of us have trained ourselves to be thinking a lot these days about what we would like to pray for. Right? And this question of, you know, am I praying in the past? Am I praying in the present? Am I praying in the future? Um, I think for a lot of us, we're thinking those things through already. And what, what I think this year we need to put our, our thoughts toward is how will we express all of that in a way that's going to feel true for us in the place that we're in physically, in the place that we're in emotionally, um, and in the trajectory that we're in emotionally, right? I'm, I'm in a certain place emotionally, but then I could be rising or falling, expanding or contracting kind of all of the directionality that we see in their prayers. Um, and to be ready for tomorrow night uh, with a plan, right? with, with an idea in our head of what direction we want our prayers to go in, um, so that we can have the richest possible experience, whatever services we're at, uh, whichever spaces we're physically in, um, however we're participating in Yom Kippur, um, to be ready to have the richest possible experience of that. So I want to wish everyone a Gemar Chatima Tova. May we all be sealed for a life of blessing, a life of health, and a, a good year for everyone. Shukla. Hi, Tidy. It's Neil Gilman. Neil Gilman. I, I actually remembered that, that yes, name Koch. later on. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, hey. yes, Koch. Hey, Koch. Uh, Good job, everybody. Yeah. Bye. 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 Tomorrow. Bye. 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 All right, we'll work something out. It's really good. Great stuff. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.